the immense age of the Earth, the fecundity of nature, and the continual production of tiny variations within species, Darwin now had the major pillars of his theory in place. He started writing drafts towards his great work, The Origin of Species, which was to explain the origin of all life on the planet. But for 20 years, he didn't publish. Natural selection had to be right, it had to be watertight. He was worried that the theory would be dismissed as just that, a theory, with no evidence to back it up. And he was worried about upsetting people, not least his wife, Emma. He wrote a secret version of the theory, only to be opened if he died. He left money to publish it too, so he wanted it to be known. But for nearly 20 years, the extraordinary idea was kept hidden in a cupboard under the stairs with the croquet mallets. A bit like keeping a unicorn in your garden shed. But still, his great work remained a secret. The problem was that he felt he wouldn't be taken seriously because his actual knowledge of some of the building blocks of natural history, anatomy, say, wasn't quite strong enough. He needed to do some hard science to prove himself. More evidence, always more. Darwin began work on a jar of barnacles brought back from the Galapagos. Barnacles took over his life for eight years as he cut up and analysed them from all around the world he realised they confirmed the secret theory. Such was the wealth of variation between individuals that it was often difficult to pin down where one species ended and another began. They were, in short, evolving. So it was all jogging along pretty happily at Down House. Patience, caution and then disaster. A letter arrived from Alfred Wallace, a naturalist he'd been writing to was working in the Far East. Wallace, independently of Darwin, had also come up with a version of natural selection. Darwin was thrown into agonies. Ever the gent, his first instinct was to help Wallace publish, thereby wrecking his own chance for worldwide fame. Friends argued him round, so eventually Darwin wrote a paper jointly with Wallace. And so, on the 1st of July, 1858, the theory of evolution by natural selection was presented to the world at a meeting of the Linnaean Society. The secret was out, and what happened then was, well, nothing, because nobody took any notice. In his annual report, the disappointed president of the society wrote, The year has not been marked by any of those striking differences which had once revolutionized our department of science. Darwin's friends encouraged him to delay no longer with the big book. Wallace gracefully withdrew from the fray, recognising that Darwin's many years of research gave him the right to claim credit. Darwin went flat out at Origin of Species, producing it in less than a year. It's not the way scientists normally work. It's not the way Darwin normally worked, but it worked. Of all the great books of scientific breakthrough, none is half as immediately compelling and beautifully written as Origin of Species. It's in better English prose than nine-tenths of Victorian novels. It fairly sings along. There is grandeur in this view of life. While this planet has gone on cycling according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. On the eve of publication of his great work, Darwin became nervous about its reception and terrified about the effects it might produce. He retreated to a hotel on the Yorkshire Moors to await the great day, the 1st of November, 1859. It's like to a murder. He had not overestimated the impact it would have. On its first day of publication, The Origin sold out. Delighted, Darwin immediately started work on the second edition. 
Within weeks, it was being translated into other languages. Everybody wanted to read it. But some of the reviews were not favourable. Though Darwin had deliberately avoided mention of man's place in the evolutionary scheme, it was clear to some that he was proposing a godless universe. Man was born yesterday. He will perish tomorrow. It was the way one reviewer saw it. It was a book which attracted the critics like hornets to jam. Jealous colleagues, rivals, bishops, the establishment, probably cost Darwin his chance of a knighthood. Prime Minister today wanted to give him one, but the bishops persuaded Queen Victoria that Sir Charles Darwin would be the equivalent of a kind of royal warrant for evolution. They didn't want that. There's one bishop in particular, Samuel Wilberforce, Bishop of Oxford, who became Darwin's most relentless and persuasive enemy. Samuel Wilberforce's nickname was Soapy Sam. He was a slippery debater. At a packed meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, here in this room in Oxford, he pitched a systematic, closely argued attack on Darwin's work. The principle of natural selection is completely incompatible with the word of God. The ideas are inconsistent with the fullness of his glory and present a dishonouring view of nature. His parting shot to Thomas Huxley, Darwin's disciple and stout defender of his views, was to ask, Is it from your grandfather or your grandmother that you are descended from a monkey? The audience began chanting for Huxley to speak. If I had to choose, I would rather be the descendant of a humble monkey rather than a man who employs his knowledge and eloquence in misrepresenting those wearing out their lives in a search for truth. The audience burst into jeering laughter and one woman screamed and fainted at such an insult to a bishop. It wasn't a trivial or merely personal victory. Darwin's evidence and argument piled up, erupting and burying centuries of old ideas almost overnight. Its effect was, is, important for all mankind. And the origin's popularity grew and grew, its sales outstripping that of many great novels. But like all great novels, the origin is a work of truth. And at its heart, there's a certain hardness, even bleakness. Natural selection is produced by the eradication of the second rate. Of all the species that have existed on this planet, 99.9% .9 are now extinct. And that can seem like a, a wasteful mechanism, constantly spewing out the rejects as it reshapes life. But unless we understand how it works, when natural selection turns against us, we're defenceless. And until the discovery of antibiotics in the first half of the 20th century, we were defenceless against plagues, TB, septicemia, countless diseases. The trouble was, we didn't listen to Darwin. We didn't take account of natural selection, which applies to microscopic organisms just as it does to everything else. We believed that through antibiotics we were on the brink of eradicating bacterial infections forever. The individual scientist in the laboratory goes on seeking new germ killers. The industrial chemist continues to develop them and improves production processes. When you take an antibiotic, the drugs kill off most of the bacteria, but a few of them may survive. And because bacteria reproduce very quickly, every 20 minutes in many cases, those resistant bacteria can multiply again and again to create a drug-resistant strain, a superbug. In recent years, a number of superbugs have emerged and patients have died. Human ingenuity is always going to struggle to keep pace with the evolution of bacteria through natural selection. In the origin of species, there's only the shortest, almost teasing reference to us. Light will be shed, says Darwin, on man's origins. He's right about that. He himself went on to discuss man's relationship with the other apes and issues like sexual attraction, blushing, tickling. But he spoke of 
open fields unfolding for a new kind of psychology. By this time, Darwin was 63 and still working hard. He caused a sensation in Victorian England with his book on the expression of the emotions in man and animals. He showed how and why we express emotions, why we scowl or pout, why we feel guilty. And he showed that it's the same for all the human races and for animals too. Human expressiveness is not a divine gift. It's not to do with fine feelings and sensitivity. We react to the same stimuli that animals do. Darwinism, like so many great ideas, was stolen and twisted by great political fools and tyrants who followed him, including communists and Nazis. Take eugenics, for example, the advocacy of racial purity. Charles Darwin would have been distraught at such a wicked misinterpretation of his work. He rarely lost his temper, but he would boil over in indignation at the very thought of cruelty and mistreatment. Forty years earlier, on his epic voyage on the Beagle, Darwin had encountered slavery in Brazil. Here on the Galapagos stands the ruined shell of the home of a plantation owner who kept slaves who used to beat and starve and hang from a tree. Darwin understood how thin was the crust of civilization that separated the so-called races of Homo sapiens. More than 150 years on, Darwin's instincts are triumphantly borne out by the mapping of the human genome. Among the human races, there are no significant molecular differences at all. It's not arrogance Darwin teaches, but modesty and respect. In his later years, Darwin continued to experiment and write books on insectivorous and climbing plants, orchids, and in his final book on worms. In typical fashion, Darwin's searching, humane gaze drew extraordinary conclusions from such an apparently insignificant subject. He calculated, for example, A weight of more than 10 tons of dry earth annually passes through their bodies and is brought to the surface of each acre of land. Worms change the very face of the landscape, burying stones and ancient monuments through their restless activity. Darwin's mind was always open, which meant he was happy to look ridiculous. For instance, testing worms' sensitivity to heat, smell or touch, and to the vibrations of various musical instruments. His son played the bassoon to them, Emma the piano. And he found a trace of human feeling in the way they seem to enjoy crawling over each other's bodies, a sexual urge that is strong enough to overcome their dread of light, a kind of intelligence at work. This is the mild battiness of greatness. Darwin carried on his relentless work schedule even into the last year of his life. But his health, always so precarious, began to fail badly. He had a seizure and collapsed while out walking. Petrified that he would die alone away from his beloved Emma and gasping for breath, Somehow, he managed to stagger the few hundred yards home. Angina was diagnosed and morphia pills prescribed, but he knew he was dying. What a miserable man I should be without this dear woman. Emma was tormented by the thought that she and Charles wouldn't meet again in the afterlife. But Charles Darwin himself, perhaps characteristically, announced that he was not in the least afraid of death. The end of the journey was distressing and painful. Dreadful nausea racked his body. He spewed blood. My love, my precious love, Tell all my children how good they have been to me. He died with his head cradled in Emma's arms at four o'clock in the afternoon of the 19th of April, 1882. Darwin's legacy, his gift to us all, helps us to understand ourselves and the planet we live on. 
And by explaining natural selection to us, Darwin has introduced us to a tool with the most extraordinary potential. Darwin is dead, but the Darwin age is only just beginning. Natural selection is being used in thousands of technologies, in computer programs, in biotechnology, in medicine. But more than that, Darwin teaches us that we are part of nature and that to thrive and survive, we need to work inside it. He is the prophet of science, but he is the prophet of biodiversity and humility too. Though the family planned a burial in the local churchyard, very quickly a national petition was organised to lay him to rest in Westminster Abbey at a grand funeral service. It would surely amuse him that the honours denied to him in life were finally given in death. And he would perhaps have laughed too to learn that the religious establishment, once so hostile, was prepared to acknowledge that he was in fact right all along. Darwin speaks to us all directly. He's modern. His vision is intimate, biological. It's part of how we function, how we feel. And it's going on around us all of the time. Back here in the Galapagos, where it all started, these fishermen are up in arms over recently imposed quotas. They want to fish where they can. They want to earn a living. Natural selection. Darwinism predicts that we all do what these guys are doing. We look after our own people first, quite short term, protect our families, we fish, we exploit, we try and help the people around us. But at the same time, by doing that, they are also destroying the infinite complexity of, of life on the planet that Darwin is also the first person to really describe. So we have two Darwinian forces colliding, and it's happening right across, across the globe. Our islands have produced many great people, whose achievements we look back on with gratitude, figures of history, Charles Darwin isn't like that. By helping us understand ourselves and the world around us, he is one of the motor forces in the world today. He is part of the inheritance of every single human alive on the planet. And it's a planet in some difficulty. But Charles Darwin's combination of human decency and unswerving commitment to the truth, however difficult, however dangerous, again points the way forward or at least it's the only way forward that I can imagine.